Number one, Old Bill. Although I now live in the city, I grew up in extremely rural conditions. If you ever heard Dolly Parton or Loretta Lynn talk about their childhood, mine was not too far off from that. My parents were extremely poor. I had many brothers and sisters, and we lived way out in the country and out of town. Dolly Parton was the first person to come to mind because of my relationship with an old man that lived in a shack even further out in the country than us. Our house was on the road, but to get to old Bill's house, you would have to walk through the woods. There was not really a road that led to his shack. It was more like a clear path you had to ride on in the middle of the woods if you were going to go and try to see him. So it was probably the most rural area that I had ever seen someone actually live. Now old Bill, as I remember calling him, wasn't a very well-liked man. I think it was because he was a bit of a hermit. He rarely, if ever, would go into town for anything. I knew he regularly hunted in order to get food, and he didn't bathe a lot either, or ever that I really knew about, although he did have one of those old metal bucket bathtub things that you have maybe seen people bathing in while watching a western. I liked him though. Like a lot of older people who didn't get to have too much company, old Bill really liked to talk. I knew that whenever my father would talk to him, he would always try his best to get out of talking to the old guy. He always found it hard to actually do this though, because old Bill was one of those guys who could trap you in a chat. I, on the other hand, liked to listen to him tell stories. It didn't even bother me that he had a tendency to repeat himself and tell the exact stories over and over again as if he had forgotten that he had told me about them in the first place. I knew a lot of the kids my age, including some of my own brothers, liked to give old Bill a really hard time though. I can recall them throwing rocks at his house, tearing down his clothesline if he had something hanging there, and yell mocking things at him. But I never did anything like that. I just liked talking to him. I don't know exactly what happened in this story, and I doubt anyone ever really found out. But there was one night, when I was about 13 years old, I spent a long time over at old Bill's shack, and it was pretty late at night before I finally went home. We were chatting, as usual, on the porch of his shack. There were some lightning bugs and the sound of many crickets and frogs to fill the night. It was hot, but since we had no experience with anything like air conditioning back then, we barely thought about it. While we were talking, I looked off in the distance because I saw two lights coming towards us. It only took a moment for us to realize that someone was driving up on that old path, which meant they were coming to old Bill's house specifically. He found the sob because he rarely had anyone come see him, and he absolutely didn't have them coming at night time. When the truck got close to the shack, it stopped when it was about 30 feet or so from the house, and it didn't turn off his lights. Telling me to stay there, Bill got up and walked towards the truck. I was a bit nervous, mostly because I found the situation to be a bit weird. However, I did what I was told, and I watched as the old man went to the driver's side of the truck. With those lights shining right on me in the dark, it was really hard for me to see anything at all. All I could make out were a couple of shadows. One I knew had to be Bill, the other obviously the driver. At first, all I could hear were sounds of talking, but not any of the words that were actually being said. However, as the voices rose a bit, I realized Bill and the driver of the truck were arguing about something. Although I couldn't make out exactly what was being said, I could tell that both men were really, really angry at each other. The only speech I was able to make out was Bill telling the guy to get the hell off of his property or he would go and get his shotgun. This just led to more and more yelling and me being more scared, thinking that the situation was bad enough that Bill wanted to go get his gun. As I stood there wondering what to do, I suddenly heard a gunshot. It was followed by some terrible noises that I really can't describe, and then a man that I still couldn't make out the details of walked in front of the truck. 
He was standing right in the light of the headlights, and he was obviously looking in my direction. I was scared because I assumed that Bill had been shot, and that this guy was the guy who had shot him. I suspected for what seemed like a never-ending moment that he was going to shoot me. I don't know how long he stared at me while I was waiting for something to happen. It seemed like forever. But then, I watched the man walk out of the light of the headlight, and the next thing I heard happened to be the sound of the truck door slamming. And then the truck began rolling out in reverse. There was no room to turn around, so it had to go in reverse the entire way out. When the truck was gone, I was finally able to make myself move. I ran out to the place where it had been parked and found old Bill's body. It was too late to do anything though. He was absolutely dead. I didn't know what to do. I had never been in a situation like this before. My first thought was to try and move his body back into the shack, but he was too heavy for me to do that. So then, the only thing I could think of was to go home and tell my father what had happened. I hated leaving his body on the ground like that. I also hated walking through the woods after I had just been witness to a murder. I suspected that any moment the man might come back on foot in the woods and decide to kill me too. I was able to make it back home without incident though, and I told my father what had happened. Now, my father didn't care much for the old guy like most people, but he did care about me. He made me stay at home while he went and checked out what had happened. My dad was gone for a long time. When he got back, he let us know he had to drive to the town to talk to the police. We didn't have a telephone back then, but old Bill was certainly dead, and they had absolutely no idea who killed him. It was a horrid experience. It made me scared of the countryside for the rest of my life. I still don't go out into the country anymore. That is why I live happily in the city. Yeah, you can get killed in the city too. At least I never watched anyone get killed in the city before though. To my knowledge, his murder was never solved. My parents are gone, and they never updated me if something had been found. Number 2. Storm One of the most anticipated moments of my life eventually became one, if not the most scary, experiences of my life. You've likely heard about people who graduate from high school or college and they go and they backpack through Europe. I was always intrigued by the idea, but I really didn't want to go through Europe. However, I had seen a lot of movies that had taken place in California with people driving up and down Highway 1. So, seeing areas on screen such as Big Sur and the others, I decided to backpack down the coastline of California on the Pacific Ocean. I had always been fascinated with the coast of California. It was so interesting to have the ocean and the mountains right by each other. I know a lot of people think of California, and they automatically think of places like San Francisco and LA, but the state has a lot of beautiful countryside as well. I began in the north, and then been walking south. I had parked my car in Monterey Bay, and my plan was to walk south, enjoy some time in the country out there, and then take a bus back to Monterey Bay when I was done. During the day, I did most of my walking along the coastline. If you've never been on the coast of California, it is pretty unique. Unfortunately, it was warm enough that in certain areas, I was able to just sleep on the beach itself without using a tent or a sleeping bag or anything like that. However, this would change when I got more into the mountains and further from the road. During the first night, I marveled at the dense fog that came off the ocean. It crept slowly off the ocean and up onto the beach. It wasn't long before I was completely enveloped by the fog. And that was an experience that, although it was not the main scary thing that happened to me, was also pretty scary. I'd been in fog many times in my life, but never a fog that was as thick as the one that was covering me. And then I was worried about hearing strange noises in the fog, and believe me, there were plenty of strange noises that night, but more or less, I was not really afraid of anything. Maybe just a little on edge, but the good kind of being on edge. You know, like when you watch a horror movie and you're scared even though you know nothing will actually happen to you. 
as I continued to travel further south, I made my way off the coast and into the hills, and that was the main point of my journey. I strayed a bit from the road, but I figured I shouldn't be too far away from it lest I get lost. I was also worried about possibly getting in trouble because I was in an area that I wasn't supposed to be in. If that happened, I could just make my way back to the road and tell the person I'd only strayed from it for a little bit. It was a few days into my walk and something happened that I wasn't expecting. A storm began moving in. It hadn't been on any of the weather reports before I had left, but weather can change pretty quickly. And if you live in California, as I have all my life, you know that thunderstorms are very, very rare the further south you travel. I tried to keep walking as long as I could, but figured it would be my best to set up my tent pretty early that evening. I didn't want to get soaked. I managed to get everything up and situated before the storm hit, and when it did, it was a doozy. Thunder cracked and hurt my ears, lightning lit up the dark sky, and the wind threatened to tear my tent right out of the ground. I wasn't necessarily worried about the tent, it was pretty heavy duty, but it seemed like something like that was possible. The storm went on for a while. I tried to find something to do. I had a book light and tried to do a little reading with the storm as a backdrop. Even though the rain was falling and the rain was loud, I stopped for a moment when I thought that I heard something. Listening closer, it sounded like there was something outside. There were some rustling sounds, but they didn't match up with the blowing wind. It was hard to tell what I was actually hearing. The storm was still raging pretty hard. I turned off my book light and tried to listen closer. I imagined any animals that might be out there would probably have found shelter. I began wondering if it was a person and exactly why they would be out in this sort of weather. So I kept listening, closer and closer. I was convinced that someone was out in the woods there. It was the creepiest and eeriest feeling I have ever had in my life. I was trying to hear things and it was hard too because there was so much noise and if someone was out there I wondered what the hell they would be doing out in a storm like this in the forest. As I waited and waited I kept hearing noises but wasn't sure about anything and then suddenly and without warning one corner of my tent collapsed as if someone had pulled out one of the stakes and then moments later another one did the same. I didn't have much time to react, but I did what I could. I had my backpack, not with everything in it, and unzipped the tent and ran off towards the road. Like I mentioned, I didn't stray too far from the road. Once I got there, I hid on the other side of the road, getting pelted by the hard rain as I waited. I was there for quite a while, looking back on the area that I had run from, but I didn't see anything there. I kept waiting for whomever, or whatever, had pulled those stakes out to come and get me. I was really, really freaked out, and as I waited there in the rain, until I thought enough time had passed, and the sun began coming up, I wanted several times to go back to my tent, but I couldn't get up the nerves to all night. I couldn't force myself to go in that direction. Eventually, when I did make it back to my tent, it was ruined. Everything that I had left in it when I ran off was also ruined, but I guess that was not as bad as running into whomever had done it, and at least I was alive, cold and wet but unharmed. I remained on the road the next day until I came across an inn. I forget the name of it, but thankfully I had my wallet on me and money. I was able to get a room and put the scary night behind me. I never finished my trip. As soon as I was able to get a bus ride back north, I went ahead and did it. The experience ruined camping for me. Number 3. The Creaking Floor When my maternal grandmother lived in Corinth, Mississippi, my family used to drive to go and see her. It was about 100 miles from where we lived in Memphis, Tennessee. We always knew we were getting close to the old house, 
because of the kudzu growing up on the hillsides on either side of the highway. As the years went by, the kudzu would grow so thick, it had to be cut back on a regular basis. My grandfather had built a house for my grandmother when they got married. He built it on a hill that gradually sloped down to meet an old two-lane highway. I never knew my grandfather. He had passed away long before I was born. Though back then, you could still see all the things he made and feel his presence everywhere you went. When we would drive with the long gravel lane, the first thing we would see was a huge wooden porch he had built for her and this giant porch swing that hung on the end closest to the driveway. The porch swing was so big it could accommodate either four adults or seven squeaking, squirming little brats at the same time. There was never any danger about the swing breaking or falling apart because my grandfather had made it to be strong, even the chance tornado and there were many in that part of the country, couldn't tear it off his rafters that it was attached to. As a little girl, I remember sitting on that gray painted porch swing with my brothers and sisters. It would always take us some time to get everyone to stop fighting or fussing long enough to swing in together. But once we achieved that, the soft swaying and creaking of the iron chains and the hangers would lull some of us young ones to sleep. I was, what the adults used to call, a middle child, which meant neither too old nor too young, neither too popular nor too shunned. In my case, however, this turned out to be different once I became, at the age of nine, a type 1 diabetic. Then I was promoted to a favored status and kept close to my mother because my illness required constant attention, she was always at the ready and over time became my closest friend. As soon as the family car would slow down on its approach to the house, and before it even came to a complete stop, we were out of the car, onto the porch and to my grandmother. After that, we were allowed to frequent our special places. My eldest sister loved the pear trees grandfather had planted years before and depending upon the season, laden with pears. By then, the black walnut trees would have dropped their green, walling saturated hulls containing the hard inner shell, with the scant nut inside that the fox and gray squirrels would go crazy for. For me, it was the apiaries. When the wind was just right, I could smell the bees and their honey. Rich, fecund, and sweet, I've never been big on eating honey, however. It was the bees, along with my grandmother, that I came to visit. As long as I can remember, my grandfather's bees and I had a special relationship. I could walk up to any bee buzzing around me, catch it with my hand, close my hand around it, and then reopen it, and watch them simply fly away. Once, when I was seven, a bee sat on my open palm, and as I watched, it seemed to be tasting something. I could see its mandible moving as though it was eating or licking. After a while it flew away. I have never been stung by a bee, not even to this day. One time, after getting out of the car with the others, I remember seeing a large spider web just across one of the side windows, speckled with neatly wrapped parcels of its previous victims. Everyone else who saw it gave it a wide berth with sounds like, ugh, or Ooh. You know, for me, it was, ah, I'd always love finding things like that. In the middle of the web sat a huge garden spider. It was yellow and black and beautiful, with its long legs and vivid abdomen. It was the biggest I'd ever seen. There was a light breeze blowing, causing the web to undulate like furrows of a sail or waves in water. The spider was rolling with the waves taking in its rhythm. I was completely wrapped. I would have stayed longer had I not felt a lightly placed hand on my left shoulder guiding me back to see my grandmother. It was my mother. Her eyes told me I was supposed to see her first before I explored or visited any of my old haunts. When I was very little, I remember that sometimes it seemed like it took forever to cross the yard and scale the steps leading up to the huge porch 
with its giant swing. At such times, I was very impatient to get there. I remember the great black oak front door that I was helpless to reach, let alone open. I can still hear the creaking on its wrought iron hinges, slowly opening and revealing my grandmother sitting at her cherrywood table, combing her ankle-length white gold hair. I love watching her gently and methodically pulling her large, medium-tooth comb nearly the entire length of her hair, glistening with white and gold highlights. It was as fine as silk and as soft to the touch. She was in her sixties then, for as long as she lived, no one was ever allowed to cut her hair. Neither scissors nor any other type of cutting implement was ever used on my grandmother's hair. When she was finished combing, she would twist and roll it into a pastry-like bun and fasten it in place with long black U-shaped bobby pins. Having finished with that, she would turn to me with her arms stretched out and say, Come on now, in her deep southern accent. Come on over here and let your grandmother hug your neck. And she would pull me close with one arm around my back and the other around my neck. I would always tell her, I love you, grandmother, which I did, and with all of my heart. She and I were the most alike of anyone in the family. We were both feisty, opinionated, and loyal. My grandmother was the best example of what it meant to be a middle child, being like one or the other of your parents' parents. I always called her grandmother out of love and respect. She did not like being called grandma or granny because she felt that it lacked the same love and respect. No one ever dared call her anything else, and once you got to know her, no one would. Years later, when my brother and sisters were old enough to have their own kids, they bade their children to show the same love and respect for our mother, too. After all the formal exchanges were complete, and we finished having supper, my grandmother and mother had made all of it from scratch as usual. We would all adjourn into the living room to listen to my grandmother tell a story. One night, when my mother was a little girl, she and my grandmother were listening as they were wont to one of the old radio mysteries narrated by E.G. Marshall, who was then a budding actor out of the 40s. He was doing radio mystery theater at the time. My mother often told me about how she and my grandmother would get up around midnight on a Friday night and listen to the family's old Philipco radio tuned to their favorite station, Inner Sanctum Mystery Theater, which was rebroadcasting some of the old radio mysteries and dramas of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. They called their favorite program The Creaking Door because at the beginning of the program there was a prolonged sound of a creaking door. It was quite late, my grandmother began, pitch black and cold out, so cold in fact that we were wrapped together like two caterpillars under one of my old handmade goose down quilts. The taper on the table was starting to flicker, and the volume of the filth was turned down to not wake grandfather. We had the quilt pulled up over our heads against the cold, when Noah, your mother's monstrously huge black cat that she'd found some years earlier, floating on a piece of wood during a flash storm, started mewling. When she found him, he was just three months old and crying pitifully. When she called him Noah, because of the circumstances in which she had found him, she was his last hope. Noah, who had been sitting in the front window, behind the heavy damask curtains, had cried out at other times because of some animal or other. But this was different. It was longer, louder, and more guttural. Noah's mewling came at the exact same time. E.G. Marshall was describing the most scary part of the story. And suddenly, jumped up from behind the curtain, he flashed out of the window, skittering across the hardwood floor and into the pitch black of the main room, still caterwauling the whole way. At first, we took this for just an effect. E.G. Marshall was having on a particularly scary part of the story. He was that good. I turned down the volume to listen more intently as to why Noah was acting that way. It was then 
that we both heard the creaking on the porch boards just outside the front door. Because the old house had long settled, whenever little creaks or sounds I had heard all over the years we lived there were only too familiar. No, this was different. In the country at night, unless there was a storm, there was always this blessed quiet that enabled you to hear just about everything. Why it was so quiet, my grandmother intoned. Some of the old folks say you could hear a mouse pooed at fifty yards. We all busted out laughing at that, and she went on. Silently, I put out my hand for your mother to get her father as quietly as possible. Waiting, I heard nothing more. After a bit, your mother and grandfather came in, as quiet as church mice. Your grandfather armed with his 12-gauge shotgun. Gesturing towards the door, I put out the taper, wrapped my arms around your mother, and the two of us hunkered back under the comforter, our eyes riveted on the front door, while your grandfather silently closed the distance, shotgun at the ready. Suddenly, we all heard a faint, yet definite, rustling sound coming from the direction of the front door. Our breath froze, all at the same time, to not miss a thing. With the deafness of a mountain lion, your grandfather cracked the front door just wide enough to thrust the twelve-gauge shotgun towards the sound, and after what seemed like an eternity let go, both barrels at the same time. There was an immediate heart-stopping shriek, followed by a blood-curling howl. It still sends tremors through me every time I think about it. Of course, after the shot awakened the entire household, all your aunts and uncles as well as your mother were told to go back to their rooms, and none of them ever did find out until much later what the circumstances of that night turned out to be. Naturally, because there was a shooting, there was a trial, and your grandfather had to go to court. The story he told was pretty much as I described it to you, about being woken up by your mother to the sound of someone or something outside the front door. But according to your grandfather, Noah, your mother's cat, had not just gone into the dark of the main room after he bolted out from the window. He had gone straight into your grandfather's room to wake him up. Noah had done the same thing on other occasions because of something or other the cat had perceived was amiss outside. And your grandfather had taken up his trusty shotgun during those times too, and checked all the doors and windows, but didn't find anything. Your grandfather thought this was probably the same thing again. You've all heard about the boy who cried wolf. Well, in this instance, it was almost a case of the cat who cried human. But for me and your mother, being up at the same time, and confirming to your grandfather that we'd heard the noises as well, Anyway, your grandfather testified that there was a moon, not a full moon, but enough light for him to see a creeping figure crouched down like some animal, low to the ground and moving, slowly and menacingly, across the lawn and towards the front steps of the porch that led to the front door of the house. At first, your grandfather told the court, it looked like a large black dog. It appeared to be on all fours like a dog, as it stealthily scaled the front steps onto the porch. When he realized it wasn't a dog after all, he got his shotgun ready and opened the door more widely, enabling him to stick the barrel out and point it at the figure. Apparently the judge and the jury liked that part of the story. All of us oohed and odd in total agreement. Earlier your grandfather told the court that when he got his shotgun, Noah was sitting on the old four-poster bed, licking his sleek black fur, as though he was content with your grandfather's decision to get his gun and make sure his family was safe. He told the court that just before he went to confront whatever was out there, he momentarily stroked the top of Noah's head, down his back, all the way to the end of his tail, as though to say, Thanks, Noah, for letting him know, my grandmother opined in both meanings of the phrase. Noah purred his approval. After that, he told the court, he set out for the front door as quietly as possible and met your mother along the way. He put his huge hand on the top of her head as though to say, 
Everything will be all right, daughter. He told the judge and the jury, with all the intent of a Clarence Darrow, that I had remained silent during the whole ordeal, knowing that I was behind him all the way. He said that with my tacit approval, he knew he could proceed, confident that everything would turn out all right. He told me with his just brilliant black eyes that we would talk about it more later. Before he opened the door, he looked at the side window and saw what looked like a dark shadow moving across the lawn towards the porch and the front door. When he cracked the door just enough to peer through the slit, the wind suddenly picked up, obscuring any sound made by either the thing on the porch or your grandfather opening the door. With the breeze, the porch swing creaked slightly. The shadow that was moving furtively across the wide porch stopped momentarily, still unaware of your grandfather's presence. When your grandfather opened the front door a bit more, the figure had moved onto the front porch. The wind pushed its way through the larger slit, forcing the door to open even wider, causing an inadvertent yet discernible creak of the hinges. Sensing something, the assailant stopped and then abruptly backed up towards the stoop. After some seconds, it moved again as if to say it had heard nothing at all. Seeing all this from your grandfather's vantage, he knew that this would probably be his last chance to deal with the would-be intruder and fired both barrels at the figure. It rose up, screaming from the top of his lungs and keeled over, still howling on his back. And it began writhing like some horribly deformed half-human spider. When the sheriff arrived, my grandfather told the court, their flashlights revealed a man wearing overalls, lying in a pool of blood, a full gas can nearby, and a match in his open hand. He was alive but in shock. He lay there gasping but afterwards passed out. Based on the condition of his private parts, it was surmised that the reason he lost consciousness probably had at least as much to do with the loss of blood and the sheer pain of being shot at point-blank rage with both barrels of a 12-gauge shotgun as the realization that he no longer had his male equipment and could never have it again. He had, as my grandmother described it, been fixed, neutered, and the shock of it, along with all the rest, probably caused him to wish that he was dead and blacking out was about as close to death as he could get at the time. She went on, Despite the near life-threatening goriness of the wound, your grandfather would later be acquitted because of the priors associated with this monster's comings and goings, as it were, into other people's homes and other people's lives. Before us, he had been doing pretty much the same thing and getting away with it, resulting in assault, murder, and arson against those who were unlucky enough to have stayed asleep until he was already inside. Always afterwards, he would set the house on fire, killing any unwary occupants to cover his tracks. Our house was the third in that thing's reign of terror, and a few of his previous victims had survived, despite him, to identify him as the culprit. My grandmother finished with, If it hadn't been for Noah, your grandfather, me and your mother, he might have done the same thing to us, and some of you might not even be here right now for me to tell the story to. All of you should think about that now. Mm -hmm. My mother and grandmother never got to finish listening to the radio show that eventually turned into a real-life scary story all on its own. It probably didn't even cross their minds that the creaking door for them was not the one with the hinges, but floorboards that could have led to the grisliest consequences for all of us present. Still listening with rapt attention to my grandmother's poignant and timely story. As for the villain, he apparently survived, though not much could be said for his love life going forward. My grandfather's description to the judge and the court of what he thought was a rabid dog was more than enough to get him an acquittal and conclude for all involved, victim and hero alike, that this was not merely luck, but more of an example of universal justice. God, if you were, who happened to be making his rounds like Santa Claus giving out presents, and to put it more plainly, my grandfather, Noah the Cat, 
my grandmother, and especially my mother, along with all of my aunts and uncles on my mother's side were, in fact at that time, good little boys and girls, and deserving of everything they got, and into the future. You might say it was kind of a happy ending had by all, especially those sympathetic enough to learn from the experience, or wise enough to never forget. Hey y'all, Kill Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, feel free to click the subscribe button and the bell below, or wait for the icon of Ichigo to Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment, and share the video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.